Okay, before we begin, everyone, I'd like to start by acknowledging the country that we're meeting on today, which for me are the stolen lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation who have lived on and cared for these lands for at least 65,000 years. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had the fortune to work with a, an amazing group of young First Nations activists called A Common Ground, and they always reflect on how often when we acknowledge country, we don't actually acknowledge country. Um, and, and so it's in that spirit that um, I really want to give just a really brief um, acknowledgement of the country that I'm standing on and I invite you all to reflect on the country that you're talking to us all from. So I'm speaking to you today from a place known as Reservoir in the northern suburbs of Melbourne, which is a very real and constant reminder of the colonial history of this place and our inability to manage the land instead of literally bending and shaping it to our will. Um, in the times for colonisation, much of this land um, north of the bay were floodplains of interconnected tributaries of Birrarung, or the Yarra River as we know it now. And it was home to a vibrant aquaculture that supported both the First Nations and the many native species of flora and fauna that call this beautiful country home. I'm not sure how much we all know about wetlands, but um, they're amongst some of the most complex and intricate ecosystems on the planet. Wetlands are so crucial to broader conservation efforts as well. They enhance water quality, mitigate floods, provide refuge for wildlife in our increasingly common dry seasons, and they help sustain grazing long after floods have receded. Um, also because of their unique ability to trap sediments and filter nutrients there, they've often been likened to the cleansing kidneys within our river systems. And in this role, they are vital to sustaining healthy rivers, wildlife, plants, and communities that surround them. Crucially, they're also amazing natural carbon sinks. Um, yet some 300 years since the first ships landed on the sovereign shores of the first peoples of this land, Australia has already lost more than 50% of its wetlands. So instead of respecting and managing the complex interdependencies of these beautiful spaces, we've extracted value at a rate that was unsustainable, leading to the need for reservoirs like the one that gave my suburb its name. So I want to acknowledge this complicated history of this place and the elders past and present who have had to bear it. I also want to acknowledge that this place has always been a place of meeting, of discussion, debate, a place of ideas and exploration. And it's in this spirit that we acknowledge the Rwandri people as the sovereign peoples of this land and stand in solidarity with their long struggle for recognition. And we hope that the treaty making and truth telling process that has been begun here in Victoria is one that moves forward in mutual respect and understanding the knowledge that we stand on the land that was stolen and never ceded. And we acknowledge that this is, was, and always will be Aboriginal land. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for what I hope will be a really thought-provoking discussion amongst all of us. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Shirley Jackson, and I'm the Senior Research Fellow of Industry Policy here at Per Capita, where I look at um, issues of economic diversification, decarbonisation, and democratisation. Uh, as most of you know, Per Capita is a think tank that is committed to fighting inequality in all its forms. And today we'll be exploring the intersecting inequalities created by the interconnected economic and ecological practices that exist in this land that we all share. Just a few brief bits of housekeeping before I introduce our speaker here today. First, I'd ask that everyone engage in the discussion in the chat as much or as little as you would like, but to please keep it respectful. Uh, there's nothing wrong with a healthy debate or discussion. Indeed, it's something that we try and really foster here in these webinars, but any aggressive, derogatory, inflammatory or, or discriminatory comments will lead to you being ejected from the webinar, I'm afraid. Uh, secondly, I'd like to encourage you all to post your questions for Saul and uh, my colleague Meredith and I will try and get as many of these questions ready for Saul um, in the latter half of this webinar. Uh, and if there are any that don't get asked, please accept our apologies in advance uh, as we try to get a really broad spectrum of topics covered. And if we skip yours, it's nothing personal and it's not intended to offend. Uh, third, please do feel free to engage with Per Capita, myself or Saul on social media. Um, we'll make sure that the contact details for all of us on social media are put into the chat. We all love a good old chat, so don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I think that's all the boilerplate that I had out of the way. So I'm thrilled to introduce the person who will be leading us in our discussion today. Um, he's uh, going to be talking to us about his new book, the big switch and how we might have a real impact on climate change by electrifying everything. Uh, he's an inventor, author, and entrepreneur who does not like lengthy intros. So without further ado, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Saul Griffith to you today. And please join me in welcoming him. Saul, over to you, mate. Shirley, I think you're the first person who ever actually did what I asked and gave me a really short intro. I am Love to follow orders, mate. I'm here to please. Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, I'm pretty happy to keep one eye on the chat and make this an interactive conversation. Um, and I'm going to be talking about this book that I just wrote, The Big Switch. But really, I'm kind of using you as a test audience for some new ideas to try and get Australia to pull its finger out of its ass. So that's actually the real agenda for the conversation. So here I go. I'm going to share a screen. If someone can confirm that they see a big Australia with a rewiring logo in it, good. All right. So um, Saul Griffith uh, grew up in Sydney. First job in Australia was in the steel mill in Newcastle. Second job was a aluminum smelter in Western Sydney. Um, so I feel like I understand fairly intimately what Australia's economy is really based on. Uh, I then spent the last 25 years in the US doing a PhD at MIT, um, then starting a whole bunch of technology companies, mostly in clean energy uh, in Silicon Valley. And then for the last couple of years, um, I've been focusing on politics as really the barrier to getting the climate action we need. I wrote this book in some respects for an audience of one, namely whoever was going to be the president of the US, namely Joe Biden now, um, but I wrote it before. I wrote it actually during the primaries. Uh, it's what America needs to do to hit, you know, a better than two degree target. Um, I've just been beaten senseless from spending 18 months in the US negotiating Build Back Better and advising the White House on climate policy. And I can tell you that we should temper our enthusiasms for, for America going as big and as hard on climate as is necessary. That's actually why I wrote this book, The Big Switch, because um, Australia has natural advantages, low population density, incredible renewables, functioning democracy as, you know, for some value of functioning. Um, and I think there is a, an unbelievable opportunity for Australia to go from being a global climate pariah for 30 years We've been, our peer nations at the IPCC have been petro states like Saudi Arabia, Russia, and Venezuela. We could rock it to the lead in on the ground, get it done, climate action. And that's the topic of this book. Um, just for a tiny bit of context, some of you may have seen this. This is from the SR15 IPCC report. These are the emissions trajectories required um, to hit a one and a half degree target. Uh, P1, P2, P3, P4. These are different versions of it. You can see they ran very many. You can see this is the zero emissions. Net zero means something below this line is going to be emitted uh, or, sorry, uh, absorbed and buried somewhere. I think we should be very honest about this. Um, this is minus 10. That's minus 10 gigatons. The world currently pulls 10 gigatons out of the ground every year in the form of fossil fuels. The argument behind these heavy negative emission scenarios is that we will build an industry bigger than all of the fossil fuel industries combined by 2050 <laughs> to suck up all of this carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. I think these are, are unrealistic and they're giving us a get out of jail free card and we really need to focus on trajectories that look more realistically like p1 and p2 what that necess necessitates this is about 2020 where i'm waving my arrow here is an incredibly rapid decline of 50 percent or more emissions reductions by 2030. so the book was about getting straight to zero grossly to summarize the book before i change tack slightly uh the answer is we have to electrify everything that's a fairly simple signal to try and help um, narrate around some of the broken debates in Australia about negative emissions, about hydrogen, about sort of false gods and false solutions. Um, whereas if we just have an electrify everything mantra, that's the great majority of what we need to do. 2020s, I would argue, is the decade where we need to decarbonize our domestic economy. That's because those technologies exist. That's our cars, our homes, our small businesses, our heating systems, our cooking systems. 
uh, 2030s, Australia's role in the world is extraordinary. We should be providing the green metals that the world needs using our, um, our very lowest cost in the world renewables. Um, we can actually increase the value of our exports by exporting processed metals instead of fossil fuels, and the world will need them to make this transition. 2040s, we get to start drawing down the carbon because we have an enormous land mass with not enough carbon in our dirt. So there's a big opportunity for us there. And we better damn hope that we did it by the 2050s. Um, really, because early emissions are the most valuable because it's a cumulative emissions problem that determines our temperature, uh, temperature, we need to go as fast as we can or faster than 2050 on the things that we know how to do. So I'm now going to talk brass tacks about what it would look like to electrify and completely decarbonize an Australian community with a goal to do it by 2040. So what it looks like, and what I'm trying to brand it as, is the abundance agenda. So we electrify everything, we'll eliminate all of the climate emissions in the community, we'll create jobs in those communities, we'll re revitalize community economics if we do it right, and we'll save money for households. I don't think we can get a plurality of the Australian electorate to believe in this and sign up for this as a national project unless it sounds like a better future, not a less future. Better means, oh, we'll have you know, largely a substitution model. We can still have our cars, they'll be electric. We can still have a big homes. They'll have giant solar panels on the roof. We can still have barbecues. They'll just be electric induction, et cetera. So we need to fight the culture war with an abundance agenda from the good team. So um, something I would love to see Australia do is to build the world's first zero emission community or a suburb zero or a shire zero if it's a regional community. Uh, I believe strongly that the economics the positive economics for a community will occur in Australia around 2024, 2025. It's already positive economics for a household that can afford the, the toys, the expensive Tesla, et cetera. Um, but I think taking one step back, we should recognize that this really is predicated on electrifying nearly everything. And the reason to do a pilot and focus on a suburb is this currently is where the pushback is. The world's distribution transmission and electricity grid organizations are starting to you see the argument say oh we can't balance the grid if we have too much solar we're not going to be able to absorb all these electric vehicles there's going to be phase mismatches there's going to be voltage over over voltages and under voltages and brownouts uh, we need to prove that is our untrue somewhere in the world as soon as possible when you actually talk to the engineers who run distribution grids, they don't think that it's going to fail. This is really just the excuse for dragging the feet used by the management. The whole world electrified in the 20th century. So honestly, the same structure of the grid that is true in Australia is true in North America, is true in Europe. Basically, we have big distribution projects. Traditionally, they were coal and natural gas. They transmit to local zone substations, those zone substations work approximately for a postcode or a suburb serving 1,000 to 5,000 households. So this is an idea to look at in detail what it would take to decarbonize a that sort of canonical unit of the electricity grid and prove that out as a global template for success in decarbonizing on schedule. So let's go through an example community. There are 3,326 postcodes in Australia. You can count them by state. Um, on average, they have 9,000 people living in a postcode, three and a half thousand households. I'm gonna talk about a suburb, Austinmere, which is just south of Sydney, about now south of Sydney. Um, and I'm gonna use that as an example to walk through the community story. So this is rewiring Australia, so postcode 2515, there it is. It includes six suburbs, Clifton, Scarborough, Wombara, Coldale, Ostama, Thoreau. If you've ever caught the train from Sydney to Wollongong, you've visited all of those stations. Uh, there's 11,000 people in that postcode, 3,000 families, close to 6,000 children, 4,500 dwellings. Um, it's a very typical, almost average postcode in Australia. Within that 
is the suburb of Austinmere where I live. It's got 2,500 people, 700 families, 1,300 children, 1,000 dwellings, about 900 are occupied, 2.7 people per house. That's pretty close to the Australian average, slightly higher medium weekly income than average, 1.9 motor vehicles per dwelling. That's slightly more than the Australian average of about 1.7 or 1.8. You can see the mortgage payments and the rent, about 80% of homes are standalone single family homes. That's about the Australian average again, about 10% are semi-detached and 10% are apartments. Again, very typical Australian suburb. Today, the grand majority of our vehicles, mostly our, our trucks and our cars are petrol or diesel. Natural gas runs a lot of the heating, a lot of the water heating, a lot of the kitchen still. Um, and most of the electricity that get, comes to us in Austinmere is uh, coal generated, about 75%. To get to zero emissions for this 2515, we must electrify the demand side of machines and decarbonize the sources of our electricity. To just draw a cartoon, we need um, to electrify the household. That means electrify 1.9 vehicles, put a vehicle charger in, electrify the water heater, or the ones that aren't already, electrify the heating systems, most likely with split systems, electrify the cooking and put solar on the roof and a battery on the side of the house and probably upgrade this little thing here, the switchboard, so that it can intelligently move the electricity around these devices. Then after clean up the electricity, a majority of it will be done on our rooftops, as I'll show. That won't be true for every community in Australia, but it will be true for most. And then what doesn't come from our community or rooftop generated solar, we need to get from our grid, from wind, solar and hydro. Uh, this is my favorite part of the electricity grid that I'm currently obsessed about. This is the distribution transformer. Um, underneath the zone substation in my suburb, there's about 438 utility poles. About 50 of them have one of these puppies. And this is what gives you the voltages that you use inside your house. This was going to transform our energy system, as we'll see. We'll need a lot less energy, less than half of what we use today. That's because the electric machines are so much more efficient, but we will need about triple the amount of electricity. Um, quick primer on that. So electricity comes to our suburb in an 11,000 volt distribution network. Here is that distribution network. That's when you look up at a pole, if it has three wires, that's the distribution um, network at 11,000 volts. And if there's four wires below it, those four wires are the 240 volt system that goes to you. In ours, it all comes from Wombara zone substation. It's a machine that you'll find probably near the railway tracks where you live that probably looks like this. That zone substation feeds a whole bunch of these distribution transformers. They step down the voltages to 240 and they serve all of our homes and all of our cars. They're typically on strings underneath that zone substation. Each string is likely to serve about a thousand households. If you look at Wambara, historically, this is our electricity demand, close to four megawatts for the 4,000 households in the winter, about two megawatts in the summer. You can see some peaks here. So this is obviously a very hot summer day in uh, 2021, when all the air conditioners were on, these are obviously very cold winter days where all the lights and all the heaters were on. We can use simple heuristics on the, on the transformation of our machines to model the future of that place. We know that um, when you electrify a vehicle, whether it be a truck, a car, or a, a minivan, um, it uses about two thirds less energy than the energy of the petrol or diesel equivalent. So only about 20% of the energy in the petrol moves this car, that's the white bit, the rest is wasted. If you're supplying wind or solar powered electricity to the batteries, you get nearly all of that, about 85% efficient movement of your electric vehicle. Similar story, if you're burning natural gas, you might get 90% of the energy out of the natural gas, but the amazing thing about heat pumps, which we now have for our heating systems, again, you know them as mini splits, is they use two thirds or even one quarter of the energy to provide the same amount of heating. Same is true for hot water heaters. Same is, oh, uh -oh. same is true for cooking. Uh, electric induction, even electric resistance, cooking is about twice as efficient as using natural gas in terms of energy used per per dinner eaten. 
the last huge efficiency of electrification, if we do it cleanly, is today when we burn coal or we burn natural gas to make electricity out there on the grid, only 60 to or 60 to 75 percent of that energy in that coal or gas is wasted and goes up the smokestack. When you generate it with wind or solar, you don't have that waste heat lost, so we get a huge win also in the energy provided to our systems. So, what does that look like for a household? On the left here, this is a, a household in Austin Mere today. They use 97 kilowatt hours of energy per day. Uh, the top bit, the orange bit, is actually the electricity, the energy being waste generating our electricity by that by coal. The gray bit there is all the energy we use for petrol and diesel. And then you can see most of it at the bottom is our electricity uh, providing all of the other uses in the house and a little bit of it natural gas. If we electrified everything in the household according to those heuristics of energy saved, you only need 35 kilowatt hours to run the same household because you've eliminated so much of that petrol and diesel energy and so much of that waste. Um, so there's a very good story. This is why I can, you can say with conviction, we don't have to shrink our homes or our vehicles. We can use less than half energy we do today. We just have to be fully electrified. Let me skip that. Um, so we can take that model and we can now look at what that means for Wambara's own substation. The black line is Wambara last year. Yellow is what would happen if we electrified the remaining water heating and space heating systems and, and, and got off natural gas. Orange is what happens if one of the 1.9 vehicles per home is electrified. And the red is what happens once we get to all electrified vehicles. So there's a big seasonal swing from two to four megawatts today, but actually the seasonal swing largely disappears mostly because of the electrification of vehicles. And we go from a six megawatt summer to a seven and a half megawatt winter peak. You can look at the daily demand variations, and this is what some people worry about, how are you gonna balance this for 24 hours? I actually think that mostly goes away. If 1900 electric vehicles in Ostmer um, were electrified, there'd be enough storage in the vehicle batteries for three days of all energy uses in the suburb. So there's a, um, an argument for enabling vehicle to grid. Thousand household batteries of current sort of Tesla Powerwall battery side would be another 24 hours of storage for all of the non-vehicle uses. So there's a huge amount of batteries going to be built into the system sufficient to deal with the 24 hour problem. You can also look at the supply problem. This looks at the seasonal problem. So here is the UTS data for 2515. If we did, and this is a conservative study, meaning not giant solar systems, but if we put total potential for solar on all rooftops would generate 70, close to 75 gigawatt hours per year, whereas the community only would need 52 gigawatt hours per year for everything being electrified. So amazingly, outside of built up urban areas, most Australian cities or postcodes can actually go nearly um, towards self-sufficiency. I'm not actually arguing that for the following reason. The dotted lines in the middle here are the um, average of the monthly means for solar generation in our community. And you can see we get six megawatts, uh, sorry, six kilowatt hours per square meter per day in the summer and about half of that three in the winter. What does that really mean? And here's the cartoon of what it means. Actually, it's not a cartoon really, it's based on a model. The current community electric load is this dotted line, two megawatts in the summer, four megawatts in the winter. It would go to this red line in a 100% electrified community, six to eight. If we had 50% rooftop penetration of solar, it's gonna be generated by this dotted line. So at 50% rooftop penetration, we meet the summer and electricity load, but we only have half of the winter. If we go to an abundance gender, because actually over generation is cheaper than storage, and we had 100% rooftop penetration as per that study, Ostermeer would be generating almost twice the energy it needs in summer, and there would be a few months in the middle where it is low. That's really why we can't use this island of disconnected. There are huge advantages in Australia for us to be connected to larger grid-based resources um, because you know, we could be pulling Northern Territory sunshine at this time or South Australian wind. 
Tasmanian Hydro, but as long as they're connected to the national electricity grid, that's how we're going to actually fill in the blanks here seasonally. So this is the future we need to get to. As much the solar that we put on rooftops is the cheapest electricity delivered in the world. After financing Australian solar is about five or six cents per kilowatt hour. The cost of the distribution grid alone for this grid generated electricity out here is 15 or 16 cents. So um, it will always be true from nevermore, even if you had free nuclear or fusion energy out here on the grid, that our rooftop solar will be the cheapest component. So communities will be biased towards investing as much as they can in that rooftop solar, it will be the cheapest, but we should also connect to these other resources. So I now want to turn to what this could mean economically for communities, because I think this is the really um, interesting part of the story. So let's talk about the critical components, yellow, solar, blue batteries, purple electric vehicles, red heat pumps. I expressed the 2021 prices and the, the cost curves that we're seeing these things come down through 2035, um, just because all of these industries are getting to scale. Actually, solar is sort of flattening out and the rebates being flattened out in Australia. So it's gonna remain about the same price. Heat pumps are getting steadily a couple of percent cheaper every year, the red line, Electric vehicles are on this incredibly steep decline. This, you know, these graphs are basically out of date once you draw them at the moment. 170% of the price of a normal petrol car was what you have to pay for the equivalent electric vehicle in 2021. It's less this year. It's widely believed that in somewhere between around 2025, it'll be break even. So you'll go to the Hyundai store and the same size and shape electric Hyundai will be the same price as a petrol or diesel Hyundai. And you can see the other major revolution here is the cost of batteries, which are, are falling enormously year on year. It is those trends that enable to you to model out the community economics of this going forward. So let's think about that community economics for a second. And I'm going to hopefully brainstorm this with all of you in the Q and A. Um, here's what the average household in Austin Mir does today. They spend $4,872 on their energy systems, three and a half thousand dollars almost on oil and diesel. That goes, that leaves the community immediately. It might create one job, but the, there's only one petrol station here uh, in Austin Mir. Um, and that money goes overseas to fund people like Putin who don't necessarily do the right thing. Um, the community spends about $1,000 on grid-based electricity, the majority that comes from coal, we uh, and about $350 per household is on natural gas. That leaves the community that money also and largely goes to Victoria to buy the gas. We are doing a little bit of solar on our rooftops and you can see some of that goes to CapEx, some of that goes to financing costs, some of it $21 in a labor for the installation from a local person um, is money that's actually returning to the community. And there's about $2 in savings from the small amount of electricity we're currently generating on our rooftops. So right now, of the $4,872 each household spends, nearly all of it leaves the community without creating any jobs. About $23 per household creates some jobs. This is what the number looks like for the whole community, spending about $6 million a year on fossil fuels for the whole postcode. It's about $25 million a year on fossil fuels that we're spending. Uh, and I want you to just keep that in your head when you compare it to what we could be doing tomorrow. So go back to the household. So no longer should we be buying coal, this should be wind and solar out here. It is now cheaper than coal. So it shouldn't largely impact the price of the electricity we purchase from the grid. I'm going to assume that two thirds of the energy we get is locally generated, a third is from the grid. So we'll spend about the same amount on grid based electricity as we do today. But we now need to have these electric appliances. So hot water heater, electric kitchen, electric space heating, larger and more solar systems and electric vehicles. We would now be spending $2,000 on CapEx buying these things, 600 odd dollars financing these things, it would mean $442 from that household. This is the 2025 picture being spent in the local community on labor. And we'd be saving $4,000 a year that would otherwise 
be being spent on energy. That's pretty incredible. So now that average household in 2025 could be saving $1,200 a year, and there could be $1,600 per year per household in community spending. 2030, it's even better. Um, we actually can model out because of the falling cost of batteries and cars, which really drives this around $5,000 per year per household in community savings. That's significant for a community where the average household's total spending is about eighty dollars to $100,000 today. $5,500 will be spent within the community um, on the labor to install all of these things, but also in the incurred spending from taking those savings and spending it in the community on other activities. Um, to think about it, I'll just go straight to the 2030 numbers because I think this is the promise for Australia. So um, for that 1,000 household community, think about it, um, there could be close to $5 million a year in community savings on energy. There could be close to $300,000 a year in electrification jobs. That's like roughly 10 new tradies. Um, the community savings should induce roughly 50 to 100 new jobs in cafes, in schools, in art centers from that thing. Three and a half million dollars a year not leaving the community to be spent on fossil fuels is the largest opportunity for community economic renewal Australia has ever seen. At the rate of three and a half million dollars a year spent among a thousand households, you literally can't build new football fields, surf life saving clubs, and new classrooms fast enough to absorb all of that. It really speaks to Australia being the luckiest com uh, country and having this incredible opportunity for local economic renewal on the back of what we must do for climate. These are the numbers, they just start getting very big, even at just postcode level. Um, you know, currently we're spending $15 million on fossil fuel, 5 million on the grid electricity by 2030. Um, we could be spending only 5 million on electricity, one and a half million on local electrification labor and saving $21 million a year in a community of four and a half thousand households. So I think that's what we should be doing, could be doing in Australia. The regulatory environment currently does not support this. Our energy regulators uh, and our local building codes are going far too slowly towards this future. Um, we need to overcome that lethargy with the abundance agenda electrifying everything, eliminating climate emissions, creating jobs, revitalizing community economics and saving money for ourselves. And I think it is useful for community leaders to now have a scoreboard of this is what we need to do. Australia is starting pretty well on rooftop solar. We've got 30% penetration. We need to go close to 100 by 2040. You can follow all of these graphs, but this is what we need to do if we're going to convert a one and a half or two degree climate target into an in-community plan for decarbonization that actually is science-based, goal-based and achievable. Oh, sorry, these slides aren't for you. I'm gonna stop. <laughs> there you go. Fantastic. No, thanks Thanks so much, Saul. Um, really, really a lot, lot of information for us to process here. Really, really exciting to see a, a bunch of people um, sharing off in the chat introduced you to a fire hose. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, and the, the book does a really, really great job of presenting a lot of this information in a very uh, easily understandable way. You put a lot of yourself into the book, which I really uh, enjoyed. And I think I said to you in our in our pre-stream chat, you know, I really liked that you included a couple of F-bombs and, uh, you know, you, you call it how you see it when you're talking about- For fuck's sake, Australia, change government already. <laughs> Vote on all these independents. <laughs> have the independents hold the balance of power and actually hold like these both parties accountable to having anything that looks like a plan that's Sorry, right what did you say no, 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 absolutely it's it's it, 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 that sort of uh, that that sort of tone that i that i really appreciate in the book um now you, you mentioned in the book uh, the the hesitancy of many government bodies both political and and public to be seen as picking winners in the economy um something that 
you know, for, for myself as a scholar of industry pol policy, I see a lot um, in our in our discourse. And in particular, I was struck by a line um, that I'm shamelessly going to use at every opportunity from now on, I hope you don't mind, where you note that by not picking winners, we're continuing to support the ideas that keep fossil fuels going instead of ending their use completely. Um, really reminds me of another really great quote by Howard Zinn, who constantly was telling people that you can't be neutral on a moving train by not making a choice. Obviously, you are actually making a choice. So I'm wondering if you can expand on this a little bit uh, and what you see as the solutions to this, you know, I guess, complex relationship we have with you know not wanting to be seen as picking winners but then we really need to be um, making the sorts of changes that you're talking about in the book so i blame the economists um in the 1970s you know i've read basically every footnote from every department of energy report going back to the origin of the department of energy in the us which was the 1973 oil crisis so richard nixon an american republican started the environmental protection agency and started the department of energy in the 1970s it was public service um public servant bureaucrats largely engineers whose role and responsibility was to plan energy for a country and you can see in that literature that tradition it, it, you know, maintained itself for about a decade. By early in the 1980s, free marketism and the Ronald Reagan Margaret, Margaret Thatcher revolution was like, oh, you know, the, the market will solve, will solve all of this. And that became dominant in the paradigm. Unfortunately, what happened in climate science is the climate science was really in by 1988. Um, and sharper and sharper and sharper and sharper to a really sharp point by roughly 2000. But instead of the task for how do you take this climate science and translate it into a executable public plan, instead of handing it to an engineering based solutions based public service, we handed it to economists and the economists chief tool that they could use was tax policy. And this is why every country in the world made the horrific mistake of trying to introduce new taxes, which were universally unpopular in every country in the world to solve climate with taxes. In the year 2000 was probably roughly the last year where you could believe that you could ramp up a carbon tax fast enough to influence a market quickly enough that it could transform itself using free market economics. I, despite things I've said, I'm not, I don't really, I've actually never voted in Australian or in an American election because I managed to leave Australia at age 19 just before I had to vote and I managed to live in America as an Australian citizen and I couldn't vote. So like take this as politically neutral, but just a, an assessment of the reality. There's a concept in climate science called committed emissions. This means if you bought a petrol powered car last year, it will emit carbon dioxide for 20 more years until it becomes a rust bucket and you replace it with an electric car. If you bought a hot water heater last year, it will statistically, that runs on natural gas, it'll last 15 years emitting CO2. If you built a coal power plant in China last year, it'll last 30 to 50 years before it's replaced with something else. There's a few billion fossil fuel powered machines in the world. About 1.4 million of them are cars. There's a billion of them are cars. There's billions of furnaces. There's billions of, or, or a few thousands of power plants, et cetera, et cetera. If all of those 2 billion existing fossil fuel machines only live out their natural life, that takes us to 1.8 degrees Celsius of warming, right? So, that means to hit 1.8 degrees, you can never sell any petrol vehicle ever again, any coal-fired power plant ever again, starting in 2022. Let's contextualize this in terms of the American free market. The free market went from 0% electric vehicle sales in, 20, in 2000 to 12 or 14% new vehicle sales in 2020. So the, the free market can ramp up. But as I just said, the free market needs to be at 100% by 2022 if we're going to hit 1.8 degrees. So it is an unfortunate but true statement that the free market cannot hit any of the climate targets of note now. So we need to very quickly... This is not to say that we don't... I think we need a grand private 
public partnership, like a World War II effort where industry plays with government nicely to get the job done. But this is to say we are, in fact, this when people say it's a climate emergency, this is a very practical expression of it. We cannot solve this without intervention in the markets and without rapidly scaling solutions. So anyone who's arguing to wait for some new technological miracle to come along is really just aiding the narrative uh, of the free market, which is the narrative of the fossil fuel industry maintaining and delaying. The other reality is we now know you can't make enough biofuels. You can't make enough synthetic fuels because they have to start with electricity anyway, which is a horrifically shitty way to make fuels. Making hydrogen, if we used half of the, you know, if hydrogen is going to power half the world's economy, we need three times as much electricity. It's just dumb, right? We actually, there. the answer is in. The winners have picked them fucking selves. <laughs> now we just need to double down like people who, you know, can grab a pair and do it. Yeah. Oh. No. <laughs> I, I, I can see how passionate you are about this, mate. I love it. I absolutely love to hear it. Um, and I guess it's another aspect of the book that um, I particularly enjoyed as someone who hosted a, a much loved short run of videos entitled Calling Bullshit, um, where, where I tried to do some of this economic myth busting, um, which is something that you do so um, fantastically in the book. Um, and it's the way that you challenge this range of misinformation and the narratives that have been influenced by vested interests from the role that hydrogen actually plays or, or can play in this big switch um, through to how much, you know, carbon capture and storage can actually, you know, do anything to help with the, the net part of net zero. Um, and I really appreciate the no nonsense way that you kind of treated what I'd call that individualist approach to climate change, um, which is really interesting. I think when we balance your focus on the households um, here, and uh, I noticed a couple of other people in the chat have had similar questions but um, you point out that, you know, while it can be good for us all to be like riding bikes and like eating maybe a little bit less meat and all those other things that we can make, you know, our own choices about, but we could all do all of those things and we'd still probably see the sorts of rises in climate that um, are going to lead to catastrophic um, events. So um, while you outline so perfectly the importance of electrifying homes and pay particular attention to how economic inequality impacts the ability of different households to make, be able to make the switch, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that and on what you think are the kinds of things that we need to see to make sure that people living in, you know, in regional areas, people who come from, you know, lower socioeconomic backgrounds are able to make the switch just like people who are a little bit more fortunate. Um. I think there were about 17 questions in your statement. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Uh, uh, but yeah, yeah. What, what do we need I, to support the lower income um, people being able to make this switch? Right. And I'll answer. I think I'd see Chantel Carr has, has said Ostia is an interesting choice. There was no choice in Ostia except that I live there right now. And it was a community that I could walk through and count the number of utility poles and look at the number of distribution uh, transformers and map map it out and think about So it was really just my personal exercise to think about it for my community, but we've actually now built a tool and we'll be releasing in the next few weeks what this looks like for every community of every socioeconomic flavor. I think what everyone should have at least got the impression, if nothing else, is this could be a good news for every single household in Australia. And in fact, it's the best news for the lowest income households. So a low income household today spends 10 to 15 percent of their spending on fuels, fossil fuels. The highest income are spending three to four percent. So it's much more meaningful to achieve this for the low income households. I think it should also be just obviously true that you don't half solve climate change. If it's only available to the top 50% of households, not only will we not solve climate change, but we'll drive an enormous cultural wedge down the middle here and we'll never win the politics of it. So as to say, you've now asked me to answer an incredible socioeconomic question and you've gone to an engineer as the expert. So I, I, I worry about you all for asking an engineer for his opinion on this. But given it, I, I really think, quite frankly, that if you can afford an Audi or a Mercedes, anyone who's got an Audi or a Mercedes or a Porsche or a Jaguar in their driveway, they can afford to do this today. And in fact, the conscious choice of buying an imported European luxury car, if they had just bought a Hyundai 
all of the other things they needed to do to make their house zero emission could have been on the spread between a Hyundai and a Mercedes. So there's 20% of households that are just not doing this because they're not aware, because they're virtue, you know, they're, they, they want the badges of high income, et cetera. I think the great Australian dream historically is a real estate Ponzi scheme where we all overinvest in our, in our castles. And Australia is incredibly used to borrow, taking on huge amounts of debt, borrowing money so that we can live the Australian dream in the suburbs. And this is available to 60 or 70% of households on the economic spectrum. And you can imagine if all we did was redefine what a mortgage was allowed, because we invented the mortgage, the mortgage was invented by um, Franklin D. Roosevelt during the Great Depression to help Americans get back to work and as stimulus for regional communities. So if we could just redefine the mortgage to also help finance the hot water heater, the solar, the cars, the, the heating system, we've got something that's commensurate with the Australian economic dream, how we've had liberal sort of economic fiscal policy around households for decades and decades and decades. And that means we can get like first 20 cent can do it themselves. The next 50% in the middle can do it through that. If we, if we proactively had economic policy based around getting to zero emissions. And then I think you're really talking about 30 or 40% of homes at the bottom end of the economic ladder. They're difficult. Some of those will be solved through public spending measures. I don't have a good answer for you for how you pass through these economic benefits to renters. We need to think creatively as a community about how to do that. Um, I think this question is the most important question in Australian climate policy, oddly. Um, so don't in any way take the fact that I don't have an answer to it for specific groups as it's like, I wish I did, because I think this is hugely important. But, you know, I think we're gonna need every tool in the bucket for the low income households from philanthropy to government spending to, you know, new economic models, right? There's a whole bunch of people frothing at the mouth to be at the trough of this great economic windfall. The banks want their bit of it. The distribution companies want their bit of it. The federal government wants their bit of it. I don't hear any advocacy group for the household or the community. Um, in the early days of the Australian electricity system, it was all owned by municipalities. So all of the economic windfall would have gone to the community itself because they owned the wires. We gave them and sold them to overseas interests in a fever dream during the 1990s, started by no other than Paul Keating. Um, if you could imagine, if we remunicipalize the wires and you are being financed through local community banks, which traditionally can extend the, the financing much further down the socioeconomic ladder. Like there's something there that feels like a solution. Um, anyway, yeah, I'm, most important question you could ask. I'm sorry. I really no, good no, no, at no. really good at electrons. Really good at <laughs> machines. Not so good on micro. No, no, I, I think it's I think it's really important that we're able to say like, look, I'm not the best person to talk to on this. And also, I, I think from from what you said, like the the point is to take the challenge seriously and yes. get people in a room to try and solve that problem instead of thinking about some of the other um, areas. So I think that's a really really important thing for us to be focusing yeah, on. Yeah, and don't uh, don't imagine that I chose Osti because for any other reason than. It helped me it's think literally about it. your backyard. <laughs> like I actually, I'm speaking to North Sydney councils tonight and I ran all the numbers for the six councils under North Sydney. And let me tell you that Austi looks like a low income suburb. <laughs> compared to North Sydney. Um, <laughs> I bet. I bet. Um, yeah. We've got a bunch of other like really fantastic questions coming in. So we'll just try and rip through some of them. Um, I think Janine had a couple of questions around like what we do around like extreme weather events in managing our storage and our, our generation capacity, like to be able to handle times like, yeah, like we're seeing at the moment with the floods or, um, uh, you know, we've had a, a range of other extreme weather events from fire to drought to all the rest. Um, yeah, what, what extra capacity do you think we need In to be able to- In every single way, what I just presented to you has enormously more resiliency built into it than our current system, right? So these things cripple communities typically for days, maybe a week or two, but not often not months. Um, in that we can re-establish the connection to the larger electricity grid, at least within a few days after the flood, after the fire. Uh, um, 
I don't, I think a lot of people hear what I say and think, oh, we're going to make our community self-sufficient and can solve all of its own problems. That's not the best model for Australia. The best model for Australia is as much storage, local generation and storage assets as possible because they're going to be working day two, day three after the disaster. You're going to have inherent storage in the vehicles and in the household batteries anyway. that will help you for those, those critical first couple of days. Uh, re-establish connection to the larger Australian grid and, you know, Western Australian sunshine and South Australian wind can be the resiliency plan for rural Victoria during a fire. Um, the inherent amount of storage in the community is, is really high. If you had to say what is the best possible use of biofuels into the future, it's going to be as part of that resiliency plan. We, we pop the cork on the biodiesel once a year or once every couple of years. It's, it's not are not disallowed to have a little bit of biodiesel for the emergency generators, et cetera, et cetera. So really, we, there, will, there will inherently be a huge amount more storage. There's still some ways we can keep some fossil fuels to keep some of the things running that will make the whole system more robust, not less robust. And the most robust of all is when we sort of have overlapping grids of communities that support each other um, when, you know, um, the unfortunately inevitable climate forced uh disasters happen yeah absolutely i think i think you outline it so well in the book around like the fact that we have this real opportunity unique in the world to produce such abundance in all of these areas yeah. and if we're viewing it as a whole system there's going to be some ability to to level that out when when, when different parts a of that system. absolutely when you run the numbers for somewhere like willoughby it's it's difficult for them to self-generate enough power Austin Mir is one of these suburbs, lower population density, where it becomes possible to think about generating the great majority. Once you're anywhere more rural than that, you know, every community can easily self-generate what it needs. Um, we, we've got a couple of other questions here that are sort of related to the technology. So I might just bring them up because like, like, like you sort of pointed out there, the bits that you feel best able to sort of tackle and talk about. Um, we have a question from- Oh, I'm happy to take uh, the economics question. I mean, <laughs> that's it. Who would, who would, I wouldn't be Australian if I wasn't prepared to have an opinion on things that I don't know anything about. <laughs> that's right. But um, uh, so Hillary asks um, what, what, what you think the role is of green hydrogen for heavy industry and in the hard to decarbonize sectors. I know you talk about this in the book so i thought this would be an opportunity to answer that question um remember that hydrogen is an electrification strategy the only hydrogen that's really going to be allowable in the future of zero emissions is green hydrogen which starts with green electrons generated from solar or wind here's the problem if i generate one unit of electricity with solar or wind and i electrolyze it into hydrogen, I lose 30% of the energy in the electrolyzer, I lose another 10 or 15% in the compression, I lose another 30 to 50% when I bring it out through a fuel cell or I burn it. So I actually only end up with about 30% of the original unit of electricity doing what I want it to do. If I did the same thing electrically, like drive a car, I use 90%. So this is why that's the origin of the, if you do significant amounts of the economy with hydrogen, you need three times as much electricity, which is kind of dumb. It also means that it's going to be three times more expensive per unit of whatever it is that you want to do. For that reason, anything that can be electrified is going to be the cheaper solution. So, but yes, there are still some industries that have some processes that need high temperature or something that might be hydrogen. Let's take one of them. Uh, ammonia, 1% of the world's energy goes into the Haber-Bosch process to make ammonia for fertilizing, which keeps us all fed and happy. There's really only, ammonia starts with making hydrogen. So there's, there's at least 1% of the world's energy is going to make hydrogen for fertilizer. So that's great. That gives hydrogen as 1% of Australian economy. If Australia made all of the world's hydrogen, we could easily do it um, with you know, excess electricity created in Western Australia. That's a, all of the ammonia. So, you know, that's a good idea. Hydrogen for steel is one of the pathways you can eliminate burning coal in the Bessemer process. And the hydrogen really is just the reductant that 
separates out the oxygen and also happens to provide energy and heat. So hydrogen is thought of as a good idea, but the ultimate reductant is the electron. So the competing process for making steel is called electrochemistry. There's a, a couple of companies having a shot at this. One of them is Boston Metals from my alma mater, MIT in Boston. They're doing very well. They have prototype cells that are making steel directly using electricity, no hydrogen. That will be used 25% less energy than a hydrogen pathway. Um, but because you have to do all of this other creation of the hydrogen, it's going to be cheaper to do it with electricity. So if you're betting on a horse for how that's, we're going to make steel, it's going to be electricity. That said, even if we made all of the world's steel with hydrogen, that's only 1% more of the world's energy. Um, are there other good uses for aviation? Honestly, batteries are going to get to the same power density as, as hydrogen after you count all of the tanks that you have to build. Remember, for every one kilogram of hydrogen, you need about 12 kilograms of very exotic carbon fiber to hold it in at a pressure that makes it practical. So that's what makes it expensive and heavy. It's not the magic fuel that people lie to you about. Um, People tell you that hydrogen has three times the energy density of diesel. That is true in the raw molecule form, but once it's compressed in a tank and usable, it's about one quarter of the energy of diesel. So we're not gonna use it for aviation. We're very unlikely to use it for shipping. Um, even if it was all of global aviation, that's 2%. Even if it was all of global shipping, that's two or 3%. So if you did all steel, all aviation, all shipping, all, ammonia it's under 10 percent of the world's energy supply this should hopefully tell you how over invested in the idea of hydrogen australia is um honestly i see it mostly as industrialists lining up for giant um gifts from the government and subsidies to their industries right now and it's that's that's what's happening and that's what all the hype over hydrogen is and that's why they're not telling being honest about the potential of it and honestly, in a world of scarce resources, this is one of the worst ways we're spending money. Every dollar we're spending on this mythical hydrogen should actually be spent on those low income communities, creating genuine jobs and genuine savings for low income households. So when you see $700 million in a subsidy going for a hydrogen project anywhere, that's money being stolen from the Australian people and given to our oligarchs. And I think you point out really um, well in the book how, you know, so many of the installation and service jobs, they're much harder to offshore. They're jobs that will stay in or are far more likely to stay in community than right. um, some of the other ones. These hydrogen plants will create very few jobs. It's very similar to existing things. I, I think, honestly, the market is going to make all of these things fall over. So the great tragedy is just that we're wasting money. Very good point. Uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so um, I'll just uh, ask one more. There's so many good questions, so apologies that we couldn't get through all of them. But uh, Glenn's asked a couple of good ones. Um, I'll throw uh, this one, which asks, what are your views on the proposal for large-scale offshore wind generation, like we're going to be seeing um, out in uh, off the coast of Gippsland down here in Victoria? Um, and what are the issues that are likely to challenge this as it moves forward, these big, large offshore wind projects? So I know a little about offshore wind. I sold an offshore wind company to Google and I'm currently doing a new offshore wind startup in California. Um, cautiously, uh, offshore wind is going to be expensive. It's going to be very expensive. The generated cost and then delivered cost because you have to have all of these long transmission lines out underwater. You know, you take something that's hard to do on land and then you get, then you have to put it on a floating, rusting container in the open ocean. Like that only adds cost. It's likely 10 to, 10 to 12 cents a kilowatt hour of generation. That's the ambitious version. And that's before, you've, um, before you get it through the distribution network. So it's going to be more of this 30, to 30 cent per kilowatt hour electricity once it's delivered to you at your house. So it's hard to see how it becomes cheap compared to solar on land, wind on land and solar on our rooftops. A lot of people now talk about over the horizon wind. So really the reason to do all of this offshore is to put it out of sight, out of mind. So I think we believe that humans and where the economists have trained us to think that we're homo economicus and that we're gonna make the perfect economic choice. We aren't. We're going to make some choices for vanity about, oh, we don't like them here and they should go over there and that will make it marginally more expensive. But, I, you know, that is to say, 
in spite of it not going to be the cheapest source of electricity in the future, we will do offshore wind and we'll do it over the horizon where we can't see it. And it will be spec, it has incredibly high capacity factor. It counter correlates with solar, which means when the wind is blowing, the sun isn't shining and vice versa. So it really makes a nicely balanced grid. Uh, I hope we do quite a lot of it, but not a huge amount because the cheapest energy system probably looks like as much solar as we can do on our rooftops, followed by as much, the next cheapest energy delivered to customers will be the community generated solar. The next cheapest energy delivered to customers will be our, our grid connected hydro on land wind and on land solar. And then the next best idea after that will be offshore wind in some economic sense. And I think you can say that with the crystal ball is pretty clear on that at this point. Fantastic. I think we could probably keep having this conversation all day, but it sounds like you've got a very busy dance card for the rest of the day. Um, and I, I just like to really I, I thank probably, you. If people will do one, a few more minutes questions, my next appointment is going to pin an award on my daughter's chest. She got elected to the local, to the, her school's council. So she's super excited. Oh, so I've got a little fantastic. bit of time if you want to. Ask That's questions. fantastic. All right, I might throw uh, one or two more your way. Um, we had one from Peter asking, do you think that um, community crowdfunding um, could be a good tool to electrify the community like we've seen some of these community projects get up here in Australia and do they need more support? I think we, I think crowdfunding has a lot of limits, but I think we should try every experiment because we don't have the perfect answer yet. I think in general, and maybe this wasn't obvious in the slideshow I said, but like when I can tell you that in 2515 postcode, there's going to be $20 million on the table in released household spending. You know, Macquarie Bank and Commonwealth Bank have already started making finance instruments because they know they want the financing piece of that. And the reluctance of some of the, the distribution companies to join this revolution is because they haven't yet figured out how they get to take the biggest slice of that for themselves. So when you say community funded, I actually really think it's in the spirit of what looks like the best answer for the Australian people. The best answer for the Australian people will be when the community finances it for itself and passes the savings on most directly to itself with the lowest overhead by using local banks, local labor, and keeping those jobs and that money circling in the community. Um, so what portion of that will look like crowdfunding? I don't know. Maybe that's a good thing to do every time we have an emergency, take advantage of it. Um, can you imagine the Surf Life Saving Club and the Bowling Club and the RSL all running chook raffles to put solar on the roof and community batteries? Yes, is that a good thing? Yes, I like that too. Should we be rate basing some of this financing? against the community rates. Yes, there's a good idea there. That will help increase the socioeconomic levels that can participate. Should we do on-bill financing? So essentially loan money to the houses to get all of this kit and have them purchase the electric vehicle back over the next 20 years because they're now saving money. Yes, we should use as many of those mechanisms as possible and to spill my politics or rather my anti-politics, <laughs> right? I don't trust any of the parties at federal level to get this done. I believe in Australian communities' desire to get this done. I believe in their ability to get it done and organise. And I'd like to see the biggest reward go to the communities themselves. Really, really uh, interesting stuff. Sounds like you're talking a little bit about um, community wealth building, um, making sure that we use the power of community to keep as much of that money circulating in communities as possible. Um, we do a bit of work on that, which is very, very exciting and, and great to hear that you you think along the same lines. We've got another question from um, Elena or Eleanor. Apologies if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, what's the difference in efficiency in having a grid with battery storage as opposed to having households with batteries? I'm sure we need both, but what would the best balance look like? As is uniquely Australian, actually not uniquely Australian. You, you could say there's a bunch of bases you could put the batteries. You could put them out on the grid next to a giant wind farm. Um, they get low utilization there. You could put them on the local distribution grid and help manage the voltages and the phases. You could put them on the side of the house and just help the house do well from its solar. You could put them inside the house in the 
appliances and help solve some other problems. Right now, it looks like we're doing the two worst of these ideas. We're putting them out on the grid and we're putting them on the side of the house. The real voltage management, grid management thing is done at the distribution layer. So community ba batteries under the substation or any other batteries between the substation and the side of your house, or in fact, the meter, look like the best guess for where a large whack of these should be. Um, you, you want them distributed in all four of these places, but it looks to me when we're, we're not, again, we're not homo economicus, no one's really run the numbers and thought about it very much. But if you would just, you know, done as much economic modeling as I have on this, the best place for the highest utilization that does the most for all of the things that need to be done, including the voltage management, the phase management, the resiliency of the local grid, et cetera, et cetera. We aren't quite balancing them the right way. Also remember that our collective vehicle battery is going to be the largest battery on connected to the grid by a factor of 10. So even compared to those decisions that I just told you about where the batteries go, the only thing that really matters is whether we connect our cars to the grid and what time of the day we charge them. They dwarf everything else in the system. Absolutely. Um, just just one, one final question, which is a cheeky one from Peter. He says, do you reckon your book should be sent to every council in Australia? Um, my mate, Mike Cannon Brooks and I went halvesies in sending a copy to all 867 sitting politicians at federal and state level. Um, Mike could probably afford to send one to every city councillor. I know that that's like above my pay grade. Um, but yes, I actually think I actually think it's not quite the right book. I think it needs to be the book with this community economic story. It needs to be to every every councillor in Australia. Well, I, I, I got to run. Really, I got to go be yeah, happy with my daughter. See you guys. That's right. No, absolutely. Fantastic. <laughs> Everyone join me in thanking um, Saul for coming along and speaking to us all today. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot more um, of these webinars. So make sure you stay uh, connected to our newsletters, stay connected to our social media accounts. I threw in a couple of them in the chat. Um, we're going to be doing some more work in this space specifically. Um, uh, I've got a very exciting project that we'll be able to talk about very, very soon in this space all around um, economic democratization, decarbonization and diversification. So keep your ears peeled. Thanks so much for the fantastic questions, everyone. Um, and we'll see you at the next one. Thanks all so much.